This week is Shark Week. We'll talk about our favorite shark movies and whether they're sci-fi or not. Plus, a shark expert comes on to tell us about how sharks evolved to protect ecosystems. And we'll talk about your close encounters with the toothy ones. All this and more on We Come From The Future. This episode of We Come From The Future is sponsored by Netflix. Welcome to this episode of We Come From The Future, the show where we chum the waters of the future and hope that we brought a big enough boat. I'm Annalie Newitz. And I'm Esther English Raquel. And this week is Shark Week. I love Shark Week. <laughs> Me too. Now, <laughs> before we get to shark fact, we're going to take on shark fiction. There are plenty of impossible shark movies, but are they sci-fi or are they just monster movies? A clear sci-fi is Deep Blue Sea, where they engineer super intelligent sharks in a lab in the middle of the sea and then are, shark are shocked when the sharks try to break out. Now, my only problem with that is why wouldn't they want the sharks to break out? Experts always say that sharks pretty much only bite people when they mistake them for seals or they can't see them clearly enough in water. Like, wouldn't super intelligent sharks interbreed with sharks and make them smarter so they'd stay away from humans? Well, then the other possibility is that these super intelligent sharks would like band together with other creatures of the sea against their true enemy, which is the humans. So instead of staying away from humans, the more intelligent they get, the more likely they would be to eat humans in all kinds of you know nefarious and 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 perhaps uh, strategic ways. So that's okay. that's another possibility. That's Definitely true. a science fiction film for sure. Um, I would argue that monster movies pretty much always do cla get classified as science fiction. Perfect example: Sharktopus, Sharktopus, another super intelligent shark experiment from Eric Roberts, who probably, he always has ideas like churning in his mind. So he's mm -hmm. like. Super intelligent shark plus octopus. Perfect combination. There's tentacles, there's teeth, there's like a great theme song. So there's a perfect, you know, sci-fi example. Now let's come to a more questionable one, which is Jaws. I would argue that Jaws is a monster movie. It's also science fiction, I would say, because they bring in a scientist to deal with the shark. Problem. The shark problem is a kind of animal behavior naturalist problem, and they have to figure out why is the shark eating people. Yeah, but I think an essential component in sci-fi is actually looking at the problem and maybe solving it, and they never do that. They just like watch the shark eat a bunch of people and then blow it up. But that's spoilers. That's a classic science solution, right? You know, you observe the animal behavior and then you know you blow it up. Blow it up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a triumph for science. I don't know, tell us what you think. Is mm -hmm. Jaws a science fiction movie because there's a scientist hero character, or is it just action, action adventure, monster, bitey movie? Yeah. All right, so whether or not Jaws is science fiction, it's definitely fiction. And it caused a lot of people to fear sharks when they really shouldn't. We're going to have an expert come on, David Schiffman, who studies sharks and he's going to tell us why sharks are actually helping us out. So you've heard a lot about how sharks are dangerous hunters of the deep, but what about the ways in which sharks are helpful? Obviously, if sharks have evolved to exist in our ecosystems, they have to be doing something right. And that's why we've brought in David Schiffman, who is a conservation biologist who studies sharks at the University of Miami. Thanks for joining us, David. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about the work that you do studying sharks out there. Sure. I, I am a PhD student at the Abbas Center for Ecosystem Science and Policy here at the University of Miami. And one of our long-term research projects in my lab, the RJ Dunlap Marine Conservation Program, is studying the local uh, populations of many shark species, and as well as their behaviors and their contributions to the ecosystem. We're studying what sharks are here, what the, and what they're doing. So when you say what they're doing, um, like I said, I think there's a lot of myths in our culture that basically sharks are just these sort of evil creatures who exist to, to rip us apart. But how are they helping ecosystems? What are they doing that's, that's making everything run? Absolutely. There are a lot of misconceptions about sharks. They're really not something that we need to worry about as a threat to humans. 
but they are actually very important. In addition to uh, being a valuable draw for ecotourism, there's lots of crazy people like me who on our vacations like to go scuba diving with sharks. Uh, in addition to that, they also provide valuable ecosystem services. They keep the food chain in balance. Uh, everyone's heard of survival of the fittest. Predators are a big part of why the unfit don't survive. Predators tend to target the sick, the old, the weak, the dying, and that helps the strongest survive. Can you give us an example? Like, what happens if uh, we get rid of sharks because we think they're too dangerous? Um, what, what will be the result? Absolutely. There was a, a really interesting mathematical modeling paper and, that came out recently, and part of our lab's research is going, to be, is going to be testing this in the field that showed that if you get rid of sharks or greatly reduce the population of sharks, then what sharks eat, uh, big, what's called meso-predators, mid-level predators, like big grouper, uh, will increase in population, and with more grouper, they'll, they'll eat more of what they eat, herbivores like parrotfish, with fewer parrotfish grazing algae off the reef, algae grows out of control and can kill the coral. And so tell me a little bit about the sharks that you study. What kind of, what species do you have out there and what, what are they like? There are a lot of species of sharks that we have here in South Florida. The most common species that my lab catches is the nurse shark. That accounts for more than half of our total catch. But we also get a lot of lemon sharks, black tip sharks, uh, recently, we caught a, a few great hammerheads, which are really incredible animals, and they're in, in very big trouble from a conservation perspective. We also catch tiger sharks occasionally. There's a lot of species that we, that we catch. So um, what, what's one of the biggest myths about these kinds of sharks? I mean, you, you've just told us about a wide variety of species, and some are big and some are small. And what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have about shark life? Well, people seem to think that every, that sharks are only there, uh, if there's a shark there, that they are in personal danger of being injured. Last year, there were about 50 or 60 people in the whole world that were bitten by sharks. And probably several hundred million people that entered the water near where sharks are. Sharks have, sharks sense, uh, shark senses of, of smell and things like that are legendary. And they can swim a lot faster than humans can. If they wanted to bite us, there would be a lot more people bitten by sharks every year. When people aren't bitten, it's usually not because sharks aren't there. So what's the secret to how long sharks have existed as a group? You're saying they're a very ancient group. How, why, why have they been around for so long? It's, it's, a, it's a model that works very well. Uh, they're, they are very fast swimming generally. They are one of the largest animals around. They can eat, some species can eat just about anything in their environment. An animal like a tiger shark is what's called an, a, a generalist predator, but that's a huge understatement. There have been crazy things found in the stomachs of tiger sharks. License plates from several different states, a full suit of armor ones, and they, they're one of the few animals around that can eat um, juvenile and adult sea turtles. So. They're, they're uh, very well adapted predators to the natural environment, but they're not very well adapted to uh, the modern world with in human industrial fishing. Thanks, David, very much for joining us. You can learn more about David Schiffman's research at sharktagging.com, and you can follow David on Twitter at Why Sharks Matter. And now, a word from our sponsor. This episode of We Come From The Future is brought to you by Netflix. Hey, it's Shark Week, and if you want to get your fill of exciting adventures under the sea, you need to check out Netflix. Netflix streams TV shows and movies directly to your home, saving you time, money, and hassle. From those schlocky mega shark movies to Discovery's own Shark Week series, you can find a wide variety of TV shows and movies to satisfy any tooth-loving viewer. When you sign up as a Netflix member, you can instantly watch TV episodes and movies streaming directly to your web browser or right on your TV with an Xbox 360, PS3, or Nintendo Wii. You can watch as many movies as you want, chomp on as many fish as you want, cancel anytime. Get a free 30-day trial membership. Go to netflix.com future and sign up now. Be sure to use this URL so they know that we sent you. So we've actually learned that sharks are helpful to have around. Are they a menace at all? We asked you on io9 to tell us all about your close encounters with sharks, and you came through. There was a person who raised sharks as an experiment, a person who actually surfed right into a shark, 
and someone who accidentally waded out into a migration of hundreds of thousands of sharks without seeing them and then waded back in alive. My favorite story though is someone who took care of sharks at an aquarium and when they were sick or somehow wouldn't eat, they had to force feed sharks, which has you asking the question, how do you force feed a shark? Yeah. And they said they had a bunch of guys who would make use oven mitts as like homemade anti-shark burn gear. Because their skin is so rough yeah. that it can really cut you up. And they'd hold them down and put like a tube through the jaws with a jug and just pump in like red dyed chum. And it was red dyed red because they had to know how much the shark was eating and you can't measure chum. So it looked like they were feeding the shark a strawberry milkshake and the shark was not happy about eating it. So there you have it. Not only do sharks not pose a threat, but sometimes you actually have to make them eat. That's all we have for this episode of We Come From The Future. Remember to find us on iTunes by searching for io9 or subscribe to us on YouTube by clicking there. And you can always find us here on Revision 3. I'm Annalie Newitz. And I'm Esther Inglis-Arkell. And we'll see you next week in the future.